And then I'm going to start the webinar. Hello, all. I see people joining. We'll be starting in like one minute. Another popular webinar, we have like 300 registrants. So a lot of people are joining again. So we appreciate um, your interest. Okay, I think we can get started. We have 127 attendees and people will pop in as, um, as they feel. Um, as they care to. Okay, let's start. So today's webinar is on triggers and alerts. So this is basically how to tell Blue Iris what you want to record and be notified on. Okay, so happy Friday as always. Um, you guys will be muted until the Q&A session. Um, you can ask questions by the Q&A dialogue and Ken is on the call as well. So he'll be answering that um, in real time. We'll be recording this webinar and placing it in our YouTube uh, support channel. And finally, the presentation as always will be shared in the, sh in the show notes as well so that and you don't have to take notes if you don't want to. Okay, again, if you're new to Blue Iris, um, there's a couple of uh, YouTube channels that I keep referring to, so you can go to that. Uh, Cajoling Technologies has some good things to get started, as well as Home Tech Video. And as always, the product we lead by product, so you can download the software and do a 15-day trial um, to get started. Okay, so today's on triggers and alerts. So it's, this is a, a handful, like Blue Wires, as we all know, is very, very popu uh, pop popular as well as powerful. And so there's a lot of triggers that Blue Wires can um, record, motion alerts, um, camera capabilities. Like this is becoming a more, a bigger topic. Like a lot of cameras getting smarter, smarter with computer vision. And so those can be provided as, triggers to blue iris, IO is a common question, audio, watchdog, external sources, et cetera. As well on the right side for what types of alerts, like do you wanna trigger other cameras? Do you wanna, the popular ones is obviously the mobile app, SMS and email, but there's a lot of other capabilities in blue iris and it's too much for one hour. And so we narrowed it down for today's conversation on, Come on, next screen. There we go. We're gonna talk about just the motion alerts, setting those up correctly, recording those onto Blue Iris, and then determining if you wanna get notified and how to get notified. That's mobile SMS and email. This is like the most popular capability of Blue Iris. If you join this webinar for digital IO questions or audio, Ken's on the call, so we might be able to field some of them, um, but these will be follow-up webinars, um, deep dives, because it's just too much stuff in one in one hour. Okay, so motion sensor basics. So once you go to Blue Iris triggered motion sensor, so if you're new, I'll just go, I'll just explain it. So if you right click on a camera settings, you go to triggers, triggered. Uh, dialog tab and then to motion sensor, that's where we're at. So I'm gonna deep dive into the motion sensor capabilities. First, let me start with basic. 
So basically you have three choices, contrast, object size, and duration. And the way to think about it is contrast is about pixel changes. And in terms of pixel changes, it's like, how much did it change in color from the previous frame to the current frame? So that's what BlueRx is tracking first. So like once you, once you identifies things that have been changing, the next idea is how many pixels change? And then that leads into the minimum object size. So BlueRx is thinking, um, have any pixel change? And if so, have enough of them aggregated together in, in, a, in, a, in a close enough area so that it hits the minimum object size. That's like the first threshold that BlueRx is thinking about. And then if that threshold um, is attained, then it's like, how long does motion have to uh, exist before you want to actually trigger? Like, that's what the make time is about. Like, I have the default is one second, which is what I have it set to, but you can change that to like 0.3 seconds to two, two seconds. It's flexible. And so the purpose of these settings is primarily to reduce false alerts. So, why would you use a minimum object size? Well, because you might have squirrels or like a cat like running around outdoors and you don't wanna be triggered on that. And so that's why you have a minimum object size. Why do you have contrast? Because, you know, it gets tricky if you have outdoor cameras versus indoor cameras. With indoor cameras, the lighting is fairly uh, consistent. And so maybe contrast can be set higher, but like, I mean, lower, but when you're outdoors and there's different times of the day and it's sunny and cloudy, et cetera, that contrast can lead to triggers. And so you, you might want to reduce the contrast, um, make it less sensitive, which means turn it, move it, move the slider to the right. And so that's why this setting is there. And then finally, um, if a fly walk, uh, flies across the, 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 the view of the camera, um, you don't want to get triggered on that. And so minimum duration helps in terms of leading, alle alleviating those false alerts. So that's a general idea. Um, some use cases associated with it. And so now you can start thinking about like what makes sense um, for your cameras. And keep in mind, like Blue Rise provides a lot of real-time feedback. So as you change these, these um, dials, it'll provide the feedback on the camera real time. So when sense gets highlighted like the yellow, that means the contrast was hit. And then when uh, minimum object size is, that threshold is hit, that means uh, motion is identified. Like that's, uh, these, sense, these, these highlighters that react real time is based off of one-to-one -to, -one to these settings. And then if the trigger highlights, then the minimum duration um, was, that threshold was, was reached. And so when you're testing, like oftentimes what people do is like, you'll go in front of the camera or whatever, trying to like trigger an alert. You can, if somebody's at the console, they can see exactly what is happening and not happening based off of what you're doing in front of the camera. So great debugging tools associated with uh, Blue Iris to, to help you figure these settings out correctly. Okay. and. Um, just some more stuff about basic, like um, home tech video has a good tutorial as well called Triggers Basics of Motion Detection. And it talks about, it goes into detail about contrast and how, um, you know, the different, you know, saying the contrast correctly may or may not help you identify people. And so it's a really good video on, on, on how to understand contrast well, especially for outdoor cameras. And then um, I threw this, um, uh, th oops, this view up because oftentimes you have a doorbell facing the front door and it's, um, you know, like waist level view. And so this can trigger, like you can't block out any of the region because as a, as a person walks in front of the door, like all of this is, is viable for in terms of like determining motion. However, like the horizon, activity way out here, which is also in front of the camera, um, you know, you may not want to be alerted on. And so how do you, res uh, you know, how do you adjust for that? Well, minimum object size is a great way to do that. So like in this scenario, you make minimum object size quite large, like um, 
you know, it could be whatever, like as people walk up, it could be like, you know, 50%, 70% of the, of, the, of, the, of the primary view. And so that way you can alleviate uh, motion associated with the horizon versus in front of the door. Okay, I think that's it for, so that's basic. So now let's talk about object detection. So where are we in terms of the, the process? So, oops, we finished basic. I'm going into object detection right now. And so an object detection, that's got its own dialogue. And so we finished contrast, minimum object size and minimum duration. Now we're talking about object travel. So this is about, um, in addition to how long motion has exist, which is the last threshold, the next filter is how long, how far does it have to move? And so why would, why would this be a consideration? Well, oftentimes when you're, especially with these outdoor cameras, uh, a lot of the stuff was built for outdoor cameras. So like for the purpose of reducing false alerts from outdoor cameras, obviously, this, uh, these capabilities are much easier for indoor cameras. But for object travels, like what that allows you to do is you start thinking about removing false alerts from like large trees and bushes. Like when the wind blows and, th and the tree has a shadow, um, this can often tr oftentimes trigger um, false alerts because a, a leaf might move a little bit in one second. However, when you have the minimum object travel, 100 pixels, then there's no way a, a, a leaf, depending on what the scene is, will move that far. And so that's how you reduce those types of false alerts. And then object exceeds is, if there's like a big scene change, like for, this is like a good use case for indoor cameras, like when you turn the lights on or lights off, that'll re result in a lot of pixels changing all at once. And so that could lead to an alert. And so the object size exceeds, allows you to reduce alerts associated with large change, uh, scene changes, um, like lights turning on and off, um, the, 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 the light outside is being blocked by, by clouds and then the clouds leave and the sunlight comes in, like those types of large holistic scene changes can be alleviated with the object size exceeds thresholds. Okay, and um, another good video from Home Tech Video is triggers and object detection. It talks about like different cameras, different resolutions. And so that the resolutions of the cameras dictates how to set the number of pixels that needs to move. And again, this video provides a good way to calibrate what this value should be. Okay, zones. So this is a common question that comes up as well. And so this is about um, areas of interest. And I, again, this is with an outdoor camera. Like what I'm doing here is, the thought process here is like, what do you care about when, you, when the camera is um, facing some scene? So I made this area A and what, it, I mean, obviously this is like a parking lot and I just avoid the boundaries, like the, the fence itself, because that's not of interest to me. So the, any noise or wind or issues like from the bushes that could be triggered, that could cause a trigger is now avoided because I define the area of interest as a parking lot, pretty simple. And this comes into play oftentimes of outdoors, like the parking lots or outdoor cameras, but it also comes into play with um, neighborhoods, like with your front door or garage cameras. Um, Activity on your property, you may be concerned about, but activity associated with the street or across the street, you probably don't care about. And so this is the easiest way to uh, identify your areas of interest to reduce noise. Again, Home Tech Video's got a lot, uh, they got a whole playlist on Blue Iris. And so Blue Iris zones and hotspots is another topic that they go deep into. Um, so if you need more clarity on this, um, check out their videos. Okay, so zone crossing. So this is like the final aspect of it. So we went through, I'm going through 
fairly quickly, but it's kind of intuitive, like once they're playing with the uh, capabilities, you know, just to recap, we talked about contrast that like number of pixels change, minimum object size. Does that, does the pixels that change uh, aggregate into like an object? Is that object large enough that it should cause that, that blue origin is considerate? Minimum duration, how long did that activity exist for? Um, how far did that object travel? And then is it, is it so large that it doesn't make sense that's an alert because it's probably a scene change. So that's where we're at. And now we're at zones. We talked about areas of interest and now we're gonna talk about identifying additional zones beyond the area of interest. And so the point of this is the scenario I came up with is like um, in a business, like this is the back door of a business and they might have like a uh, receptionist slash security personnel at the front at the front door, but they wanna monitor the back door too. And so an easy way to do that with Blue Iris is you create a zone, like you create a zone in front of the door, in front of the door, like I call that B. And you can specify like if there's activity at B to send a, uh, like a, for example, a push alert, a uh, mobile app alert to the receptionist at the front door. And so they know when to look or draw, atten uh, draw attention to the back door and see what's going on. And another common case is there might be noise associated with just B. So like you could do, are people walking from like the sidewalk to the door? Like that could be another proxy. Uh, this, it doesn't really, it's not as, as strong a use case here because obviously people from the parking lot is gonna walk straight to B. But that being said, if you wanted to provide some level, you know, like determine some, some level of continuity in motion. So like you can have multiple zones, B and C, and you can specify it logically. Um, there's, a, there's motion from B to C or C to B, and that can uh, trigger an alert to the receptionist. And in terms of like determinal logic, like the B to C, that would be in object detection in object zone crossings. And I, I, I'm gonna do a demo on this. So that's a lot of information. It's in the recording so that you guys can digest it you know, later on, but I'm gonna do a demo uh, very soon to explain all this, uh, make it more conceptual. The final aspect of triggers is hotspots. You know, I only have outdoor cameras, so um, this doesn't really apply for outdoor cameras because you know, like a hotspot is you skip all the filters. And if there's any motion in that area, like in red and the right, um, send an alert. Now for an outdoor camera, this doesn't apply because that would be a lot of noise and it would be a lot of you know false alarms. However, for like, if you had like a museum or an art gallery and you were like focusing on like the Mona Lisa, um, cause I should never move or never be, you know, for theft purposes, um, hotspots is a great way to um, address it. Okay, so I'm going to do, do the demo now. So I went through a lot of stuff um, in terms of features functionality. I'm going to tie it all together right now um, with the demo. And so what I'm going to do, so some concepts you need to keep in mind first um, is, is this visual metaphor on the bottom right. So, you know, cameras are sending in all these frames every, you know, like, depending on the camera, like 30 frames per second, for example, and Blue Rice is receiving all that information. And so when you wanna like start uh, tweaking and fine tuning your alerts, things you have to conceptually think about is you need a pre-trigger buffer, which is, I said for 20 seconds, it could be, you know, it's user defined. And then you need to like specify the make time, which is associated with how long that activity has to exist before the trigger, and this is the actual alert that is re registered and recorded on Blue Iris. And oftentimes the default for that is like 10 seconds. So how do you set all this stuff, first of all? So like, just uh, keep this in the back of your mind, how do you specify a pre-trigger buffer? Um, that's actually in the recordings tab. And that's what the setting's for. And I, put, I set it for 20 seconds. Uh, the default is off, so typically you don't, record pre-trigger uh, pre buffer. But if you want to like fine tune your alerts, you'll need that. And um, so we'll talk about that in a second. The make time, where do you find that? The make time is in the trigger dialog in, um, 
uh, oops, over here, sorry, wrong dialogue. Make time is over here in, um, I gotta move this, hold on for a second. My view is being obstructed by Zoom. Okay. In the, in the motion sensor dialogue under the basic section. So that defines this time. And then finally the end trigger, like how long does the alert run for? That's based off of in the trigger, in the trigger dialogue. So three separate dialogues in order to provide these settings. But once you do so, you can really uh, fine tune and um, improve your, your alerts. Okay, that's some logistics. So what are we gonna do for the demo? Um, I'm gonna show you some clips that are working and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna provide this use case. So like what I'm, what I'm gonna do is this is the gate of an office complex, the front gate. And I'm gonna try to make a more specific um, trigger slash alert uh, for the security for the security staff of this company. And what I want to do is like I want to I want to know not the cars that park up in front um, in this area, but the cars that drive through from go in from B to C or leave from C to B. I just made up this use case, but it it it, it exemplifies a lot of the capabilities of Blue Iris in one demo. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm like, these are cars that, that I'm concerned about. So, you know, cars can't fly. So all this stuff up top, I'm gonna to say like, I don't really care about it. I'm gonna define two zones, B and C. And then finally, I'm gonna say like, um, objects of car size has a go, any, any, any car, any objects of car size that goes between B and C or vice versa, send me, send me send alert to security. So how do I do that? So here we go to the demo, cancel that, cancel that. So I already preloaded the stuff. Um, so let me go to camera settings. So let me go to trigger and let me go to configure. And so these are the defaults for minimum object size, like all the stuff that I just talked about. So I, I haven't changed anything there. Now for zones and motion between zones, I'm gonna click on zones and hotspots and do edit. And my zone A is where I define my area of interest. So like I said before, like cars can't fly. So all the stuff up top, is not of concern to me. And um, and so that's why I defined zone A as you know the, the driveway of the parking lot. And the way you do that is you know, I can clear it. It's really simple. I, I, I prefer rectangles, you can use brush as well, but you know, like this is the top of a of an entry of a garage door. So like that's the way I did it. I just, you know, drag over here and boom. Real simple. And then I just find the other zones. So I define this, like this is area of not interest. And now I'm gonna do B and C. So B is, zone B is the left and zone C is the right. And that's how I define my areas, okay? I'm gonna hit okay. So now I have my areas, but now I need to define the logic. like. I only want, I'm only concerned about cars that go from B to C or C to B. How do you do that? You go to object detection, you go to edit. And then I would say object cross zones, B to C. So this is, the dash is uh, bi-directional. There's a whole bunch of logic. You can go to the help files um, to see all the other stuff that, that's possible. It's pretty powerful, like the logic you can provide. Um, but um, this is a simple use case. Now, just uh, if we're doing like back and forth discussions, if I wanted to also send alerts to security that not only the cars that drive through, but also cars that parked here in area B or cars that parked in area C, that's also super, super simple. With Blue Rise, I can say like comma, area B, 
comma, area C. And so that would capture cars that are parked in B and C as well, and send those alerts to security. But we'll just stick to our, my original plan. Cars that drive through, I'll hit OK. I'll hit OK. And I'll hit OK. So the camera is going to register that. And so now I just created a new alert. So how do you know if it's working or not, right? That's the next question. So you let it run, just let it run for um, like an hour and, and you know see what alerts come in for that camera. And then you, then you can go back and troubleshoot, which I'll talk about in a second, but that's how you start. You, you had some idea for uh, capture, you know, capturing motion, you created it, and now the way to know if it's working or not working is let it run and, um, and see what you get for alerts. Now, if I were really debugging this and trying to like really fine tune alerts for uh, that car, uh, well, that was, a, that was great timing. So like I created these zones, but that car didn't trigger an alert. So I still need to fine tune this, um, my scenario. Um, but uh, what I was gonna say is like, I am recording, I am recording on alerts, which is okay. But what you really wanna do is, I don't have the storage to like do it because it's gonna fill up my hard drive. But if I were really gonna debug this, I would choose um, for recordings, not when triggered, but continuous because when, if I have it this way, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna, I, can, I can debug the alerts and determine which ones are false alerts. However, if you don't have continuous recording, you don't know like that, that, that car that just went by that didn't trigger an alert, like you would not know that you are missing alerts. And so that's why you want continuous recording. And then like after an hour, like, well, let's see if this truck triggers. The truck triggered. So I, I well, this is a great example. Like, so I would want to debug, like why did, why did the truck trigger, but not the car trigger? And so we have continuous recording, like you can, you can play like over, over an hour and then see where the missed ones are as well. And so that's, that's just as important as, cap, as, as making sure that you capture the ones that could be a false alert. I hope you understand, I hope that logic makes sense, but that's, um, that's very important. So continuous recording is also good when you wanna like fine tune your triggers. Okay, that was great timing with that demo. <laughs> Okay, so what I wanna uh, do next, uh, where's the debugging slide? Oh, well, this is very understated. It's like, I'm gonna go test run video through the motion ticket. So now like say, like, so I did this yesterday, right? So what I, I have some flags that I've already preloaded of some good clips to give examples on. So here is how you can go back and see if your alerts are working. Like this is a great way to get instant feedback on how your motion alerts are working. So, um, in th uh, I gotta move the zoom thing, hold on a second. Okay. Okay, so what did I do? I, I'm starting at this clip. I wanna make sure my trucks are, are running. So I set up a pre-trigger buffer, so that was um, 20 seconds, and then I, the one second is how long to uh, determine if there's significant motion, and then I start the clip. So why did I do that? So like, I'm at the start of uh, the pre-trigger right now. So like, now I can right click and I can do, there's these great options. So like Blue Iris by default is gonna send you the overlays from what's happening currently, okay? So when I play this, so when this alert was created, it's, it's, it's showing how, what the motion detection was doing. So let me start this. This is the pre-trigger, nothing's happening. Now the truck's coming in and it's yellow, so like, the previous settings, the original settings that I had was 
um, didn't have the zones, right? And so it's going to um, it's going to show it's going to show the truck coming in, coming in. It's yellow, boom, red. So so for this scenario, and it seems like for most trucks, like we just saw from that live video, the truck seems seem, seem to be captured accurately um, with the original settings. And what I mean by original settings was, just to be clear, is when I go to camera settings, the original settings, I had, I didn't have any zones and I had no, I had no logic associated with zones because there, there were no zones. Like this was the original settings. And that's, that's what is being shown in terms of it working with this truck, okay? Now I change the settings, all right? This is what, this was really cool about Blue Iris. So like, I'm gonna, I changed it, right? So I'm gonna change it back now. So I'm gonna say like, I want zones A and B and was that gonna provide better accuracy? So I can do configure, use zones and hotspots. I'm gonna go to object detection, put the logic back in, boom, boom, boom. Camera's gonna reset. Okay, so this shows that it was working before and this is how it was working. Now I'm gonna change this. So I'm gonna remove add motion overlays from the original settings and turn that off. So what's that gonna do? So if I go back to the start of the clip and play it, nothing. I turned I did, I turned off what was happening before. Okay, so that, you know you have to do that, and then test run video with motion detector. So now I just changed the motion settings, right? So now it's going to run the same clip with those new settings, and so you can see if what you're doing is improving your logic or or not. And I find this like very powerful. So that's why I'm excited about this like feature. So like, look, I put the zones in, right? So now it's clipping the ceiling. Like this is like no longer an area of interest. Super cool. And then the truck's gonna come in. And then, Oops. And so it, it, it still caught it. So I, I didn't break anything, but did, I'm not, it's kind of subtle, but like the alert came much later. So like it still worked. I was still getting an alert based off of the changes in the settings, but the alert came much later. Um, and that could be an issue. Like I'd have to debug it some more, but now I know, like I know like what was happening before. And I know like after making changes that how it's improving or changing or altering the motion detection. I said, this is the way you find him. This is like the process. You, you go into your camera settings, you go to your triggers, you go to your motion sensors, you make some changes, you hit okay, okay. You, then the camera record uh, registers those changes. You go and do test run with motion detector. And um, and then play some clip that worked before and make sure that it still works. Like this is the way you know if you broke anything, which is like which is like awesome. And so um, so that's one step. And then the other step is um, do continuous recording. And with continuous recording, you can also identify like if you if your current algor algorithm was missing stuff, you can find out where it's missing stuff. And that's when, when you would start like fine tuning as well. So, okay, I hope, hope you guys got that. And I hope you guys are excited about all the capabilities of Blue Wires that I am, but that I'd share that. And the final thing is sometimes you guys, you guys get stuck and we ask you like, all right, why don't you send us a short clip, a BVR clip, and then we'll run it through uh, on our end and figure out how to fine tune it. And so in order to do that, it's really simple. So you just go to clips, so if I want to like send send something, um, this doesn't. I mean, I have to wait for a car to drive by to like, you know, really make this meaningful from this scenario. But like, say you're at your house and you want, you're trying to like uh, activate, trying to like.
figure out some trigger by like walking in front of the camera. Like you have control, you're by the camera, you can walk in front of it, um, determine the activity and then send that clip to us to like determine how to like modify your settings. So in that scenario, all you have to do is like ADS7, all you do is, um, where's the cut clip? Uh, Where are my clips? Yeah. Cut recording. It's not recording. Oh, it's not recording. All right. Let me let me trigger it first. I'm first. I'm forcing it to record, so it, it's going to go red. Oh, I was in the wrong clip. Sorry. So now it's red. It, it was probably red already, but anyway. So, if I want to create a new clip to send over to um to us to like take a look at. You just um, cut recording. So basically, I just told Blue Wires to stop this recording, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna create my own recording. So I'm gonna start this camera's recording. Now I'll walk in front of the camera and do some activity that I'm trying to like trigger on. I assume I did that. You know, a couple seconds, whatever. Stop the recording, and then there it is. And then you can go to open in, where is it? Show. Yeah, you have the camera menu. If you want to right click on the clip area somewhere. Oh, OK. I'll do have to cut it again. Uh, it's optional, actually. You can send it while it's still open. Okay. Um, what I usually do is I, well, I would probably just cut it. Let me just cut recording. So then I would just go to the open containing folder, find the file. Where is it? And there it is. It's highlighted. It's a little short clip, only like 1K. And then you can just attach to an email and send it to us. Okay. Okay. So I hope that's clear. Like, how do you debug your own videos? And then if you wanted to send us a short clip, um, that's how you do that. Okay. So I went through the first half of this was this demo was creating your zones and creating your triggers. And then the second half of this presentation, I'll talk about actually sending the alert to security. Okay, so summary, so motion trigger. So um, from the trigger dialog, all we focus on was just motion sensors and all the capabilities in here. I hope it's clear um, how to determine what these settings should be. Oh, I also wanna highlight um, blackout zones. So like, it's a great way to debug as well. So if I, um, I created zones, right? So if I go to camera settings and I go to trigger and I go to sensor and I created these new zones, right? And I wanna see if it works. What Blue Iris does is like, it can show you like where the zones are. So blackout masked areas, another super cool feature. So now it shows what is area of interest, but it doesn't show areas B and C. And the reason it doesn't show areas B and C is because the area of interest overlaps both B and C. And so B and C is being shown, but since it's the same area, you can't see the, the, the distinction. So how do you get the small zones in, within your area of interest? Well, that's easy too. Camera settings, trigger, um, configure, edit zones, Zone A, just clear it. So the, the zone A, the area of interest, boom. And now you get you get to see the different zones. And one thing to keep in mind is Blue Eyes is very flexible because once you define the area of interest for the entire scene, um, it'll overlap the specific regions that you're providing logic on. And why that's important is because um, just in terms of like tracking objects in software, like 
if you have, if you, you know, like instead of making you guys be super careful and making sure these are adjacent, you have to deal with that because once you have that area of interest that overlaps both of this, um, Blue Wires um, is, knows and can track across areas. Um, if you didn't have the area of interest overlapping both these specific zones, then because there's a gap, the software stops. And so when the object is here, it's going to be object A. But when it goes to object uh, zone B, it's going to be identified from the, even though to us it's intuitive it's the same car and it's the same object. Because there's a gap, the software is not tracking. And therefore, the object that comes into zone B is another object. Is as far as the software is concerned, is another object, which is why it's very important to make sure that you have an area of interest for the entire uh, scene of the camera. So I'm going to go back to triggers, configure, edit, zone A. I'm going to put zone A back, like the overall, I'm gonna, I like rectangles. And so I'm going to just fix it. Okay, okay, okay. And now there's no longer gap. And so therefore, if it goes from A to B or B to A, I mean, B to C or C to A, um, we, can, we can track it and, and record and trigger it. Highlights, I turn them off because, you know, like once you're in a clip and you're trying to figure out what's going on, like Blue Rise allows you to do it. Like you can just right click and say, um, I'll turn off the test, add motion overlays. And so you can see it when you want to versus seeing it all the time. So for the live view, I don't really have it. It's a user preference. If you want it, you can have it. Um, that's fine. Trigger, I'm gonna turn off my masks as well because it's good for debugging, but I, I like to see the entire scene. Yeah, I, I turned it. This is this way I like it, but you know everybody's got their own preferences. Okay. Anything else of interest? Ken, if you have anything that you wanted to call out um, in this webinar, I think those are the biggest topics, like ninety five percent, ninety nine percent of the concerns that users have, but. Um, I'll take silence as we can move on. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we finished triggers and we're going to go to alerts, but I thought this might be a good time to pause. And I see raised hands as well. So I guess it is a good time to pause. Um, all right. Let me um, unmute you guys. Go ahead, Cal. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yep, you there. Okay, I was just wondering if you could explain those logarithms, what the difference is between them, and why you would use one over the other, maybe? Oh, the algorithms. Um, I can answer that. I mean, yeah. really, there are just two. It's um, either simple or edge vector. There was one that was used called Gaussian for a while, but um, that's not deprecated, meaning that we don't recommend it as a to use, uh, it doesn't really offer any, any benefit um, over simple uh, other than using more CPU. So uh, simple is, as the name implies, it's just looking for basic pixel changes. Um, and it still uh, tries to uh, compile objects or pixels into objects. So it can still do object tracking that way. But uh, the Edge vector adds a, a layer on top of things where it's actually more intelligently looking for motion in a specific and um, linear direction usually. So it, it'll filter out things like waving trees and leaves and that sort of thing. That's what it's designed to do. Um, but you know, if you have motion that is like you waving your hand and you say, why isn't it triggering? Well, the edge vector is kind of designed not to trigger in that case. It's really looking for very consistent, you know, left to right, up, down motion. 
It might also not be appropriate if you want to <coughs> capture a lot of image or <coughs> excuse me, motion where um, an object is coming towards you and may miss some of those actually, because in that case, it's just it's kind of pixels growing, you know, it's not really moving from left to right or, or any specific direction. So in some cases you may want to switch back to simple. Okay, thanks. FYI, these controllers are really good for, like, to, to get granular. Like I talked about it, I alluded to it last presentation as well, but like if you want to just go frame by frame, you can do it. Um, you can get really granular on, on, on what's going on with the, each clip. You can like, you know, go fast, go slow, you can rewind by dragging. Super cool. Like makes it really easy to like help you to help you uh, debug and fine tune. Oh, lots of raised hands. Okay, hold on. Allow to talk, Rainer. You're on. Rainier, sorry, I'm not quite sure. How... Yeah, no, that's fine. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, you're there. Awesome. I, uh, so, no, I was just wondering, like, all the various options that you show, uh, if there's any in there that are uh, high, that have a high resource usage versus others that have less, because I, I know a lot of people are always struggling with that. You know, the more cameras they have, the more uh, resources it's all taking. And, and uh, I, I, I understand that some of these options take a lot more than others. So maybe you can, what, what's your uh, take on that? Okay. Can you want, yeah, you want to take that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the way the motion alg algorithms work, it's really only sampling uh, every couple of seconds until there is some change and then it starts sampling at a faster rate. Um, it is not looking at every frame. Uh, so you're sit having some savings there. Um, it is um, combining pixels into uh, groups of pixels. You'll see that when you draw the zones, it's uh, they're like boxes. Um, sorry, I have a bird. <laughs> I need to put the bird away. Um, yeah, so the, uh, if you, I really, in my opinion, it's, it uses very little CPU to do this, but um, also you can use the substream as well. It uses the substream, not the mainstream, so it's fewer pixels for that, for motion detection. Um, but uh, if you really are at the very, very limit of your CPU capacity, um, you, may, you may look at uh, using ONVIF uh, triggering from the camera as well. That's fine. Um, or a combination of both. It's, it's an option. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, awesome product, by the way. Thank you, though. We're also going to, um, like, once you have more time, like a webinar and just find, like, CPU usage, like the trade offs, like dual streaming, all these little things that um, can affect CPU usage and optimizing that. So we'll oh, dive into it. It's, it's, a, it's a common question. So um, we'll definitely do that too. Yeah, that'd be awesome to see that. Okay. Uh, Kiri allowed to talk. There you go. Yeah, hi there. Uh, afternoon. Uh, just a quick one. So, I, I think I've got my motion detection configured pretty well, but there's a few things that you covered in terms of the object size. Now, my object size is zero, which would literally technically say that it would catch a fly or whatever. So, can I just ask you a question? In terms of when you adjust the object size, uh, the, the, the little box that it shows you, would that be physical in relation to the perspective of the camera? So if I increase my object size, for example, and you get the box, obviously the box increases and decreases, depending right. on the size. Yeah, so look, for example, we're like, okay. So if you go to the, yeah, you can see, yeah, so mine's currently set to zero. So I capture everything, but the thing is I've got a very good zone that's set and it's kind of, I've like, in high resolution painted over my fence. So I've kind of mapped it. So I don't get any false positives unless an object goes there. But if I do increase that minimal object size up, is that, so can you see how that's increasing? Would that define that object to that size exactly? Yeah, this is uh, respective to the, uh, like, the, you know, this is like, uh, this is, um, what's, what's it called? Um, that respective to the size of the object, that's what I'm saying. So if I make that box quite big, I may not get birds, like a size of a bird. If I make that box big enough, well, that would then not capture 
like birds or squirrels or whatever like yeah is that yeah the exactly case? yeah th this is visually telling like this is um this is um what's it called like um uh it's um it's proportionate to the actual okay. camera so like um you're saying like the the the, the object's got to be at least relative to the entire frame this okay. big um, all right brilliant yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, it is. It does not have to match that aspect, though. It's just, um, it's just for you to get a visual representation of an, of the size. But it could be taller than wide, you know, it, as long as it has that same area. Okay, and just finally, just a, just another quick one. In terms of like, um, like if, for example, you know, like if you get a cloudy day and then the sun quickly comes out, that will always trigger an alert. How can I go around avoid, try, trying to minimize that? I think you briefly covered on that earlier. So if I get an overcast day, for some reason, if it's very quick, I get a I get an alert. Can I change a setting in order to try and minimize that? Yeah, exactly. Do you have object? It's under object detection. And then um, that's what this is about. Like, um, like if, if the light changes, like you can imagine like more than 67% of the pixels will, will change color because the, the light changed, right? And um, right. this would uh, avoid those alerts. So what the, the value has to be higher. Well, it depends. Like, like the default is sixty-seven percent. So that means, like, if that's not working for you and you're still getting alerts, then you want to lower it. I don't. Okay, because currently mine sits at eighty. Mine's on eighty percent. Do I need to lower that? It depends on what the um, experience is. Are you getting alerts that you don't want to be getting? Yeah, exactly. Like, if I go to my kitchen because I've got a camera in there that overlooks, even if I turn the light off in there, I can always get an alert. It would just, it would just happen. So. Yeah, then you would lower this. I would lower it, yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, well, listen, thanks for that anyway. Yep, yep. Cool, thanks. It's 8.52. Hey, Ken, are there any like pressing questions that we need to address from the Q&A? Oh, wait, more raised hands too. Okay, hold on. Yeah, we'll let you go ahead. There, there are a number piling up in there and um... I'm trying to pay attention to those and you at the same time. But um, did you want to share any of those, or should we just keep going? Just go ahead with the Q and A. Okay. Um, well, that that raised hand went away. So, should I continue with what uh, the the alert the alert side of it? That's really quick and simple too. Trigger six most of the time. Unless you want to answer some. Are there any questions that we need to address uh, for the audience? Q and A dialogue. Um, well, I've been typing some answers. What I'll do at the end is anything unanswered. Well, quite a few of them at the beginning were asking for the demo that you that you've been doing. But um, let me go through some more. Things. Okay. Okay. All right. I'll continue on with the uh, alert tech because that's like um, that's that's actually much easier. All right. So that's the gist of motion alerts. And now we're going to talk about the plumbing. Like, how do you connect this to like a meaningful alert that you want on your phone, SMS and email. All right, so first thing to keep in mind is like Blue Arch, as we all know, is very, very powerful. So like there's, so this is a, this is actual metaphor between how do you connect triggers to Blue Iris for recording to alerts? It's all right here. Um, so if I turn, so like in this screenshot, I turn motion zones off. So what did I do? So like all that stuff that I did in triggers um, for, you know, zone B to C and creating that car, a, a more a more meaningful alert for car drive-through, like none of that's gonna go across the alerts. I, uh, if I turned it off at the alerts tab, basically I turned off this pipe, like this connection from Blue Iris to the alerts, you know, engine. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. So like, like we get tickets every so often where I didn't change anything. Uh, my mobile alerts don't no longer work. And then it, it gets kind of hairy because, you know, it could be a mil it could be a million things, right? And you always think it's on the alert side of things. But then, you know, sometimes we'll find that they accidentally turned off like extern, which is for mobile. I think that, 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 that ties the mobile apps or something. And um, so keep that in mind, like this is like a on off switch. Okay, that's all I have to say for that. 
Okay, so the way I, so I really don't mess with the uh, the previous. I, I really I I just keep all these on because the way the way I think about it is like if I wanted to be an action based off of that that trigger, I would do it on this end of things. Like I would turn it on here. Like if if nothing's turned on for this. Then this is off anyways. So that's the way I think about it, but it's up to you guys. There's options, there's choices in blue areas. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, all right, what's my use case? So I'm gonna do oh back to the original use case. So like say I want like a more comprehensive alert um, for alert security when cars enter and leave the, the campus. I want to send a mobile alert to security. That's 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 my use case. Okay. So what I'm going to do is it's really simple. Okay. You go to Blue Iris, right click. So it's on it's on a per camera basis, right? So you go to camera settings, you go to alerts. All the stuff is on because I don't want to I don't want to mess with it on the, at this level. I go to on alert, and then I already set it up. So you know you, you add and you choose what you want. So right now I'm I'm going to send a push notification, a mobile alert to all the people that have security phones that you know have mobile phones with the blue Wars app that have been identified as security personnel okay very specific so all i do is i go here and um what am i concerned about i'm concerned about uh motion i turned everything else off because there's a very specific alert i'm sending it to the security tag so like in my blue iris for all the mobile devices, I'll get to that in a second. I'm going to tag some of them as security. And so all the people with the security tag uh, in Blue Iris, basically all the security personnel will receive this alert, which is exactly what I want. And what I'm saying is for the motion zones, all I want to care about is um, activity between B and C. Between, so B and C, not B or C. So it's a little tricky, but I checked B and C because of that. I want to see all the activity that goes between B and C. And then the logic is any is or, like does, uh, is, there, is there activity in B or C? All means and, so B and C. Equals is even more tricky. Like this is when you have to like really know what you're doing. Um, remember how I talked about um, in order to set up your zones, you first start with your area of interest, like zone A, right? And by doing that, you don't have to worry about overlap between the other zones, the sub zones B and C, especially when, you, when you're tracking motion across it. So for most people just doing, and if there's activity between B and C is, is, that, is that logic. If I were to do equals, that means only B and C and this alert would not work. So let me, let me, I, maybe a picture with pictures with a thousand words. If I do and, how do I test that it's working? I can just do there's a test right right within the app, and I can do if there's activity between areas B and C, is it going to trip? Yes, a push notification was sent to my phone. If it was just sent, if there was a, if there's activity just in the overall area, is it going to is it going to uh, trip, skipped, not going to happen. So this is how you can test whether the logic you provided is accurate. So suppose suppose it's activity just in B, is it going to trip? Nope. And if it's any of this other stuff, which has no zones defined, no alert. So this is how you test your logic. So um, that's great. Now I want to show you like the difference between B and C and versus equals. If you do equals, that means it can only be in B and C. And as you as we know, like there's a gap between B and C. So it actually goes from A to B to C, right? So if I do B equals C and I go um, A, B, C, because this is what's actually going to happen. It's, it's it's um a skip, it's avoided. Wait, let me try that again because that's that's uh, that's a better way to explain this. So um, just in push. Okay, wait. Let me uh go back to uh. 
Let me change it back. I'm gonna change it back to any, I mean all, so B and C. What that does is if it goes to A, B and C, it's gonna work, okay? But if I do equals B and C and I do A, B, C, it's gonna be skipped. Now, why is that important? Because when that trigger happens, it actually goes from B to A to C or C to A to B because there's a gap between B and C. There's a gap between B and C. And so that's why you have to be very careful about how you set up your zones, whether you use equals or, or all. But basically, I think most people would just want all. That was a lot of information, but it, best practices in general, just use all or or, and very rarely would you use equals. So if it's in B and C or A, B and C, it'll work. So that's how you test alerts. Okay. Hmm? Okay, so where are we? So we just went through triggers and alerts and we talked about recordings all last week. So next week we're gonna talk about, um, we're gonna talk about schedules and profiles. And so now we're gonna get into like really, really cool stuff that you can do and that's super powerful with uh, Blue Iris where you can, you know, we, we, we specify this alert, security receives alerts for cars that drive through. Okay. Um, with profiles and schedules, you can also associate time to um, the alerts. So, like when cars drive through at nighttime, send a, a push notification to security. Otherwise, just send an email alert. Like, for example, like this level of granularity becomes more and more detailed and can solve really detailed business problems and maybe even home home, home concerns um, as we start layering in more and more capabilities. So that's where we're at, we're, we finished triggers and alerts. Next week we'll talk about schedules and profiles. And this is where we're going. So like in terms of like a lot, a lot of really cool stuff that we can do, like business owners gets, you can have like a business owner gets employee notifications when employee opens or closes the store. Uh, we'll, we'll show you how to do that. Security can receive alerts during off hours. And then the shipping personnel could receive on their iPad, for example, when packages arrive. So these are types of, you know, real use cases that you can solve with BlueWires. Okay, email alerts, um, just for completeness, you know, I said we're gonna talk about push, email, and SMS. For an email, just keep in mind the, the, uh, the documentation is very clear, but you can't just set up an alert without setting up an email server. So please, you know, you know, follow the instructions on how to set, set up your email server first. And then with SMS, um, this is really email to text. And so this is based off of the capabilities of the service provider. And so there might be some issues or restrictions, um, which is oftentimes why people buy the uh, mobile app where like a carrier might, might specify a specific size. And so if you attach a image, it might be too big for the SMS. And so they might cut it off, for example. Things to keep in mind, but um, it's very, the help files are very intuitive and explains fairly thoroughly how to um, set up your SMS. And that's it. So we just finished, uh, after this Friday, we just finished triggers and alerts. So we can open up for uh, more questions now, if there are any. I'll answer one from the Q&A is um, Jeremy's asking about the high definition option and when you would use that for uh, the motion detector. Um, really that comes down to your minimum size objects that you want to detect. Um, if you see that they're smaller than uh, what you're gonna get with the, the resolution that's shown um, on the zone, the zone page, the zone map drawing page, then you can go to a high resolution option, which basically uh, quadruples, it attempts to quadruple the number of, uh, of uh, we, I call them pixels still, but it's really their combination of, um, 
pixels that make boxes in the, uh, the zone drawing page. Um, you want to keep in mind when using edge vector, the way edge vector works is you need enough pixels in that detection algorithm to have a leading edge and a trailing edge for your movement. Um, if you're using, if you're not using high definition, it may be difficult to, to achieve that with small objects on the screen. Uh, meaning it might, they might just occupy one or one or two of the small boxes that are used for the detection. So you might want to use high definition. So it might have eight or 10 boxes instead for an object. That way it'll have enough pixels to have a, a leading edge and a trailing edge for the, for the algorithm. Hey, Ken, is this a good perspective? Is this, is this a, a possibility? Oops, I just moved. But like, is that a good possibility for high definition where the camera is maybe too far to like um, provide a, a good level of accuracy for identifying objects? Yeah, is it based, well, is this, it based off a of perspective, I guess, like the distance? Yeah, so in the scene here, if you're trying to track, uh, you know, small, small animals walking down the street or small children or people even, because it's such a, a wide angle, um, that might be, it might not be enough of uh, detection uh, with the standard resolution, you might have to bump it up to, to high, high definition. It will use uh, slightly more CPU because it's quadrupling the number of pixels that are going into the algorithm, basically. Okay. Okay, Kiri, you can now. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's just a quick one for Ken. I was just wondering, Ken, if there's any news about the upcoming update for Android for Blue Iris, the mobile app. Yes, um, I have. Uh, this is something that I outsource, and um, this person is uh, promised me to have it soon. <laughs> this is. I've okay. seen a few. Uh, I've seen a few. Um, a few uh, demo shots, screenshots, and so on, and it's looking good. Um, okay. If, if you cool. like the look and feel of the uh, the iOS app. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. So, are you? Are we, is there another webinar next week as well? Yes. Next Excellent. week is all right, guys. Next week will be um, uh, scheduling and profiles. I think. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. All right. Thank. Thanks a lot. Take care. Yep. Hmm, no raise. Oh, here's a raise hand. Cal, go ahead. Uh, yeah, somebody had asked a question about uh, spider webs and spiders. Did uh, you address that? Did I miss it, or can you do that quickly? I have yeah, 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 for sure. Like, uh, yeah, it's a common question. Um, best way to do that. Um, so, what? Uh, what? Uh, these cameras don't have any spider webs, but I remember dealing with that. With um, uh, actually, I think this is one of them. Like, let me see. I think it was this this one at nighttime. So like what we did was we put, it was like the, it was like the top left, like up here where the spider web was. So it was causing a lot of alerts at nighttime, especially with IR. And so what we ended up doing was uh, because it didn't, because it was up high, we were lucky. And so we provided an area of interest that avoided the spider web. And so that reduced all the alerts. Um, that was the easiest thing that we were able to do. Yeah, that's what I tried, to, but it, sometimes those spider webs go clear across the screen and screwed up for the whole night. It's yeah, I know. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Um, uh, Ken, do you have any other ideas for spider webs on cameras? It's a common problem. Yeah, well, the way it is right now, I mean, they, they'll just appear as very large objects moving around your, your image. So um, you would handle that the same way you handle everything else by, you know, maybe setting a maximum object size, maybe setting a zone crossing rule. So as you go from B to C, um, the object travels, all of these things are designed to try to filter out false triggers, basically. But ultimately, uh, where we want to go is to add uh, more machine vision AI to this, where it will uh, exactly. make a distinction between types of objects. That's really the end goal for this. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. 
Yeah, I remember I did something like this, like um, like blacked out that spider web thing. That's what I did. I got lucky because it wasn't the entire camera though. Uh, go ahead, um, let's see, Kiri? Or did you already ask, ask your question? Frank, are you, are you, oh, I gotta mute you, hold on. Here you go, Frank. Hey. Um, so the thing that I'm struggling with right now is the trigger starts to record and then the object stops moving and then it stops recording and then the object will move again. And so I've get like these cut up clips. How would I deal with that? Well, this is where uh, you would use, it's called the break time. So this will help you bridge uh, from periods where it's triggered and then it's not triggered, then triggered again. Really, uh, you can just um, increase the time of the trigger, which is the break time right here, so that you'll get more of that. Because you're absolutely right, if the object uh, pauses or stands still long enough, it, the algorithm starts to treat it as part of the background, and then it becomes a whole new motion detection after that point. So what you want to do is um, increase that break time. Is there any way to change settings across multiple cameras at once? Well, this is a, the, it changed for version five. It's called a sync. So yes, if you put cameras in, into groups and you want similar settings between them, um, you use that setting up there that uh, Sam is pointing at, sync with camera. So you define one that you're going to call um, the model camera basically. And then all of your other cameras will be dependent on that camera for their settings on this page. So if you change the settings on the model camera, um, that will automatically uh, propagate to all of the other ones that are synced with it. How do you, def uh, how do you define the model camera? You, well, you, you just by doing this like this, you say sync with camera, the hike or hick, that, that will then be the model camera. And then ADF5 oh. will be dependent on the, the settings for that camera. Got it, got it, okay. Um, you know, I've, I've received a lot, uh, to be candid, I've received some, some negative feedback on this. Um, some people preferred the way it just, we used to have a copy paste option. Um, so it's still something in transition, I, I would say. I mean, I'm very responsive to how people are using it and feedback, so um, may not be the end <laughs> with that. Right. What about that um, third party which I'm not sure it's third party, the AI service that you can purchase. Um, there was no mention of that in this in this video. Yeah, this is mostly on Blue Wires. Ironically, I used to work with that company. So um, uh, you, just, you just want some feedback, general feedback on the service or? Yeah, I mean, I, I noticed that you, Ken, you said that the goal was to incorporate AI, but then there's that other service. I just wondering on kind of the direction. Um, you know, for my, for my day job, you know, we're pretty close to, so I use Blue Iris at home, but my day job, we're pretty close to getting Verkata and we're pretty pumped about Verkata. Um, and I'm using spot.io. I'm doing a trial of that as well. So, you know, I see all these, um, you know, I've done some Meraki demo. I, I see all these really neat features. Um, and then when I use Blue Iris, it's like, it's all there. It's just, it's dependent on me, you know, the user to set it all up. So, um, but I, I'm enjoying it. I just, uh, obviously I want that easy switch where it all just works perfectly. Yeah, as you see here, we've, um, we've partnered with Sentry, um, but it is an add-on at this point. Um, there are some, customers doing some very ingenious things with um, it's called AI tools and deep stack. And um, I've been working with some of them to, to fine tune the, the workflow for that uh, to do with the dual streaming and the high res and the low res images and so on. Um, so 
really, I would love to at some point more formalize that. Um, so it's not so much of a, um, you know, right now you have to find it yourself basically through the forums. It's not really mentioned and it's not mentioned in help. Um, but it's amazing what they're doing with it and Blue Iris. So um, we want to definitely leverage some of that as possible going forward. And that uh, to, to further uh, answer that, um, that uh, AI tools that they're using is able to distinguish between people and cars and animals and all of that. So, I mean, it's all doable. People are doing it today with Blue Iris. It's just not formalized here in the interface. It's more of a, um, you know, an add-on do-it-yourself kind of thing. But uh, that could change as well. I want to see that change. With, um, when making all these settings, is is it best practice to like save out in a config file so that, you know, I've got all this stuff in case my machine explodes? Because um, I would hate to, I don't know, it seems to be you've got to really dial it in just right. And then God forbid, you know, if I lose all those settings, I'll be, you know, I won't remember them. <laughs> yeah, back on the, uh, the main uh software settings page there is uh there's an export option that's everything that's all the cameras it's all the settings um then there's also an option to automatically export it as well and that creates a an export each day basically that um, yeah yeah perfect okay thank you you are welcome thanks frank That's it for raise hands. Any other questions? Uh, if, if there's other pressing stuff in the Q&A pod dialogue, um, feel free to share that, Ken. Uh, yeah, uh, here we go. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, there's, well, the, the most recent one, somebody's asking, um, is there a way through alerts to either flag or otherwise get a listing of other, of only high priority motion? detection events. Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah, we definitely have the ability to uh, flag. Um, you can manually flag items. But the way these people are using the AI tool in DeepStack, um, it does a callback and it will put, as you see here, the, uh, the not or do not symbol on these clips. That was put there by an AI service. Um, so it may have been uh, Sentry that Sam's still using here, but the AI stack deep stack um, does the same thing. So we'll have it will confirm the alert or cancel the alert, um, and you'll get the appropriate icon. And then yes, you can filter just to see those uh, using that folder icon that um, is at the top of the alerts list there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we got another question from Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, Peter, you're on mute. Or maybe it was missed hand. Oh, David, hold on. There you go. Go ahead, David. Yes, hi. Um, some of my cameras, well, I think they all have their own built-in software that includes alerts and triggers and all that. Uh, and I also use Blue Iris to you know, kind of manage it all. Is it okay to have the cameras trigger on their own software and to also have Blue Iris trigger? The short answer is yes. Um... We haven't talked about it yet, but that's that's what this topic is about. Like um, the Envif, Envif, like if the camera provides Envif integration to those um, capabilities on the camera, then you can pump those into Blue Iris as well, and then trigger off of that. So you can have Blue Iris as well as the camera capabilities sending you alerts. Okay, and then they won't interfere, conflict, or 
No, no, no. Like, um, you know, you, 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 you determine the wiring. So like, if, if you say that you have, if you have blue wires recording, you know, capabilities from the camera, then you decide like, what do you want to do with that? Like, if, like, do you want to send, like, whatever you want to do, like you can do. And so there's no, there's no conflict. You might get two alerts, like, you know, blue wires might trigger and then the camera might trigger as well, but that should be fine if you, you know, if you can, if you're concerned about those activities. Thanks. Everybody with the raised hand has their their audio unmuted. So if you want to, if you had a question, uh, please ask. Otherwise, I what time is it? 9.30, wow, another hour and a half webinar. Okay, um, if there's any other pressing questions, please ask. Um, if not, anything else in the Q&A dialogue that we need to discuss, Ken? Um, there, there are a few things in here. I'm not sure if they're um, appropriate. Well, let's see, one is, um, I'll just read it, what I was just reading. Does this mean that BI's motion detection is still pictures, keyframes from the video stream based? Um, I believe it was from a previous question that I answered for him. Um, but this goes back to the, the algorithm samples twice a second looking for motion um, in the image. And then it ramps it up as soon as there's anything, as soon as there's any change at all, it starts going to at least eight uh, times per second. Um, but based on this question, the, uh, he's mentioning keyframes. Uh, so the interesting thing is if you're using the setting called uh, limit decoding in the software that only decodes keyframes unless uh, unless there is um, motion in the image or uh, you're highlighting the the um, frame. But um, yeah, you want to make sure that you have enough keyframes going into the into the detector in order to. Uh, trigger basically. So that's one of the reasons that we recommend having a keyframe uh, one per second, um, no less than one every two seconds. So the motion will continue to work with limit decoding enabled. So I can show a quick demo of it. Like if you have it unselected. That's becoming less necessary to use limit decoding um, as people are now using more uh, the substream because it's now the substream is that's being decoded. So these are schemes to save CPU time, basically. Uh, so you can use both together, substreams and limit decoding, but really it's unnecessary. You'd use one or the other. So like the way, the way you would notice it is if you look at the time, the, the time it'll jump 55, it might be every second, but oftentimes it's two seconds. So you're not getting it, it's it's not you're not getting every second. And then if you turn it on, you'll get every second. So that's the um and and the reason for that is the keyframe itself, like the camera's sending it every two seconds more or less. And so by decoding every frame, we're forcing it, we're forcing Blue Iris to recognize every not recognize every every keyframe, but every frame that comes in, and that's why you get every second. So it provides a more smoother um, live view, I guess. I hope that was accurate. Was that accurate, Ken? <laughs> I hope I didn't misstate anything. Yeah, that was fine. Um, you did notice when you had the limit decoding on that it did jump up to show every second and decode every frame. It will do that automatically if there's any motion detected, like you have some cars going back uh, by on the left. Um, so that could cause it to ramp up to do. Full. Oh right, right. Okay. Um, last. Last call for questions. Otherwise, um, we'll make it a wrap. Another hour and a half webinar. So um, thanks for your participation. Kiri, do you have another question? 
a really quick one in relation to hardware accelerated decode. Is it viable to use your graphics card or will the CPU suffice? Uh, say that one more time, I'm sorry. Right, um, yeah, you know the um, hardware accelerated decode? No, just stop it. Um, is it viable to off pull that to your GPU or will the CPU suffice? Um, yeah, well, that's uh, exactly what the hardware accelerated decode is. It will use the, the GPU as available. Um, so uh, many Intel chips have that built in um, and uh, NVIDIA cards are a great option for that. Um, if you don't have either of those, uh, the AMD may be supported through uh, the DirectX option the VA2, but in my experience, it doesn't offer uh, nearly the discount in CPU that uh, NVIDIA and Intel do. It may okay. be because it's going through a few other layers, but. Okay, great, all right, fantastic. Thank you very much, guys, anyway, thanks. thanks. Okay, great, I think uh, we can wrap it up. Um, I think that's all of it. So, okay, well, uh, thanks guys. And we'll see you next week on, what's it, schedules and, um, schedules and something. <laughs> schedules and profiles. Yeah, all right, thank you. Bye everyone, happy Friday. <laughs>